Good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to uh, be talking with you today with two colleagues. Um, one is Roberta Moore, who is now a film producer, uh, but was a longtime English teacher in, uh, at Florida Southwestern State College. Uh, and retired about five years ago and uh, is in her new incarnation as a film producer. And um, Sahar Lasu is my graduate student at the University of North Texas. She's in the doctoral program and uh, specializing in counseling clients who have had transpersonal experiences. And I'm Jan Holden. I uh, am a professor of counseling at the University of North Texas. And I've been researching near-death experiences since my doctoral dissertation research in the mid-1980s. And so we're here to talk with you today about um, suicide and near-death experiences, um, and particularly uh, leading up to a video that we are um, in the process of putting together uh, to use for suicide prevention that is based in um, research, uh, a little bit of research and, and a lot of uh, clinical e uh, experience or reports um, about the value of using NDE information for suicide prevention. So leading up to that, uh, Sahara is going to begin by taking you through a, a little bit of uh, literature review on suicide and near-death experiences. Then I'll talk with you about uh, some interviews I did of suicide near-death experiencers who obviously survived. And then Roberta will talk with you about the, um, the video we're planning. And we hope to have plenty of time afterwards for uh, question and answer and discussion um, including uh, you bringing in anything that we neglected to mention. Or, um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Sahar. Great. Thank you, Jan, for that wonderful introduction. Um, as you are about to find out in a few seconds, English is not my first language. So um, usually when I'm in front of a large audience, um, my accent gets thicker, and um, I'm hoping that you would just hear right whatever doesn't come out right. Um, so with that, I want to um, take you through this PowerPoint presentation that I have um, regarding um, a little bit of an overview about suicide and ND. So um, in the next uh, few slides, there we go. Um, I'm going to present a fact about either near-death experience or suicide, and um, after that, I'm going to pose a question about how that fact relates to suicide. And first, I'm going to present some um, support for some stronger research finding regarding that um, question, and then I'll move on to present a contradictory um, finding um, with research that we consider to have weaker support. Um, all right, so um, beginning with the um, content of near-death experience, the emotional tone of near-death experiences um, seem to be uh, pleasurable with only about 10% distressing um, experiences. And so the question comes to be, um, are suicide-related near-death experiences pleasurable or distressing? And the more strong, um, the stronger research supports that these NDEs are also um, pleasurable, and there is um, some support that the near-death experiences that result from a suicide are um, distressing. And you notice that I referred um, Dr. Moody's um, research in this, and I just want to um, let you guys know that in my review of literature, I found out that later he recanted this report. Um, and. Um, he also agreed with the fact that um, uh, NDEs resulting from suicide have a positive emotional tone. Next, we move into the features of um, near-death experiences. In general, NDE contents include a combination of different features, uh, non-material features, material features and transmaterial features. And so an example of a non-material content is a peaceful floating, um, an example of material um, 
content is typically be an out-of-body experience and a trans material um, content includes um, perceiving and interacting with other worldly environments and deceased loved ones or spiritual figures. And so the question that comes from that is, do contents differ between suicide-related NDEs and NDEs um, during illness or um, as a result of an injury? And the research supports that um, there's no difference between um, these um, uh, different NDEs. Um, however, that doesn't mean that there aren't any individuals who, um, uh, however, it doesn't mean that um, uh, there are a fewer trans material um, features in um, suicide related NDEs. Um, the next point I wanted to share with you guys is the suicide proneness of adults. In general, someone who's committed suicide is likely to commit again. Um, and the question with that is, are adult suicide and deers more prone to attempt again or not? And the stronger research supports that they're not more prone to attempt suicide. And that comes because um, as a result of their ND, they have a greater sense of purpose in life. Um, and they realize that suicide is not an escape. Um, and sometimes a distressing NDE may result, um, may discourage individuals from uh, attempting suicide again. And here, um, there is some support that even though individuals um, usually do not attempt suicide after an NDE, that doesn't mean that no one um, attempts or completes a suicide after an NDE. And again, um, just wanted to um, bring this point up about children as well, um, that in general, someone who's attempted suicide is more prone to commit suicide again, but um, the question comes to be that are children suicide and deers more prone to attempt again, and a stronger research supports that um, they do, um, there, there is some evidence that children will um, attempt suicide again because of a desire to go back home. Um, but there are also some evidence that shows children um, do not commit suicide after an NDE because of the parent-child relationship and also um, finding a greater purpose and meaning in life after um, having an NDE. And so the collective testimony of suicide um, survivals and other near-death near survivals, um, if is um, interpreted rightly, it promotes a cause of life and not death, um, especially via suicide, and endears that uh, hold that suicide does not free one from struggles that they face in life. And so the point that I want to leave you guys with in here is that most um, suicide and years do not attempt to commit suicide again, not because it's wrong, but because it's not in their best interest. Um, and so there are um, many practitioners who have successfully incorporated near-death experience accounts in their practice, um, which led to clients' greater realization that consciousness continues separate from physical body, and um, as a result of incorporating near-death testimonies into um, their practice, their clients um, have a greater understanding that suicide does not end emotional pain, um, but sometimes offer, offers a new opportunity for individuals to um, come back and face the circumstances that they were in again. Um, it also helps clients uh, recognize a greater meaning in life and mobilize their internal resources to face challenges of life. Um, and um, practitioners also have used videotapes of um, NDE testimonials to um, individuals, clients that had suicidal ideations, and they realized that um, this intervention has helped significantly reduce the suicidal ideation among their clients. And this also held true for children as well as um, grief process. So about uh, almost 10 years ago now, I brought um, four 
suicide near-death experiencers to the University of North Texas to do in-depth interviews with them. And um, I brought them to the university on the same day uh, so that when I was interviewing one of them, the other three of them could entertain themselves together. One of the, just as an aside, one of the interesting things that happened is something that I've observed uh, several times with other NDEers, and that is uh, I came back from one of the interviews, and the other three were all excited because one of them had started talking about electromagnetic after effects, and the other two had not connected that their electromagnetic after effects were, had really started after their near-death experience. And whereas uh, near-death experiencers tend to um, be able to verbalize after effect changes. Uh, this is one area that uh, several near-death experiencers don't naturally connect, that um, the electromagnetic things, the malfunctioning electronic devices, the inability to wear a watch because the battery dies and that sort of thing, um, is really an after effect of their NDE. So it was really kind of uh, neat that they um, benefited from talking with each other that way. Anyway, um, to tell you a little bit about what I learned from that, and, and my purpose in doing these interviews, and I recorded them on camera, um, was to develop, a, potentially develop a um, suicide prevention video, and then um, academic life being what it is, other priorities intruded, and I never did anything with it. And then when Roberta and I met and began talking, um, and I realized this is and this is a, a possibility. She kind of got excited about it, and that's where we're going with this. But uh, before we get to that, just to tell you a little bit about what I learned from those interviews, um, one of my interviewees was a Hispanic male, uh, Ruben Beckham, who has since um, made his transition, and um, he attempted suicide as a preteen in Mexico. Um, he tried to electrocute himself with um, a um, heater, and he was explaining to me the kind of heaters they had in Mexico and how he could do something to electrocute himself. And he did attempt it, but of course survived. And um, talked in probably of all the people that I interviewed for, for the project in the most moving tones of how in his near-death experience he really got that his life had value, meaning, and purpose, and that to, um, to foreshorten his life would be um, a sort of violation of a privilege, and also something that he had actually participated in uh, planning, that he had been a, a planner of his own incarnation in this lifetime. And, um, and he, so he really um, 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 encapsulated the quality of someone who has learned that um, this isn't, this isn't the, the thing to do. Um, and again, not because he felt judged or that he was, uh, had a sense that he would be punished. It, it really wasn't any of that. It was that, um, that life has meaning and purpose and challenges are opportunities to um, advance in our spiritual development. Um, I also interviewed Yolaine Stout, who as a, a, a Caucasian female, uh, as a young adult, was in a very, uh, what she perceived as a completely hopeless and inescapable situation. And uh, in response to the hopelessness and inescapable quality, she uh, every night would go to bed and try to will herself to die. And uh, she got quite good at it because one day, one night, she had a, a near-death experience. And in that experience, she first of all experienced uh, love like nothing she had ever experienced in life. And also a sense, a realization that what she perceived as inescapable really was not. 
and that the sense that um, in her uh, seeking of suicide, it really was her psyche knowing that something about her needed to die, but it wasn't her. It was her perspective, her approach, the limitations that she had placed on herself. And as a result of that experience, the near-death experience, she extricated herself from this situation and um, moved forward in her life. And among the things she has done recently is founded the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences, which is an organization dedicated to helping uh, training um, health professionals, particularly mental health professionals, but not just them, to work with clients who have had spiritually transformative experiences to help them um, integrate the experience and really use it to its maximum in these people's subsequent lives. So she really, um, her life did a, a 180 as a result of her near-death experience. And then I also interviewed Matthew Davel, um, a Caucasian male, and uh, he actually had two near-death experiences in his life. One was as a result of a drowning accident uh, when he was a young teenager. And then later in life, well, interestingly to me, um, he, um, as a result of his first NDE, he didn't have anybody to talk with about it. And the after effects were so overwhelming, the only relief he could get from the effects was uh, drugs. And so he got very involved in using drugs. And uh, he got to the point that he had what he described as a $1,000 a week habit uh, as a young adult married with an infant daughter. And, in, and so he uh, came to the conclusion that he was of no earthly good to himself or anyone else. And he one day drove in his car to a, a nature preserve. And he had pills and a bottle of um, alcohol, and he took the pills and he drank all the alcohol, and his intention was to kill himself. He proceeded to have actually a distressing near-death experience. And what made it distressing was that in his life review, you maybe have heard that in the life review, people often have the experience of being on the receiving end of their actions. And so they experience um, receiving what they have um, have um, done in their lives. And that's normally uncomfortable, but usually not awful. But in his experience, he um, was, um, he said for three days and three nights without let up, um, he was experiencing people from his past come up and they would bump him uh, like bump his chest, and in that experience, he would, he would experience what he, he had engendered in them. And he made the point that it was not people you'd think are important, like his wife, but like one of them was a grocery clerk that he had had probably a 45-second interaction with, and he was so nasty to her. He experienced what she felt, and he also experienced how she then turned around and was in a bad mood and treated other people badly, and he felt what they felt, too. So he felt all the repercussions of what he had done. And so um, um, eventually, in his first near-death experience, he had encountered Jesus, and Jesus had told him at that time that he had work to do. But he was 13, and he didn't know what Jesus was talking about. In this one, he's now a young adult, um, he, at one po at, at the end of the three days and three nights, I'm giving you a little abbreviated version, but he felt, uh, he saw a hand come down and literally lift him out of the place that he was, and it was the hand of, of Jesus. He had another conversation with Jesus. Jesus again told him that he had work to do, and this time he kind of got it because he became... After his near-death experience, he never did drugs again, and now it's been many years. 
and he uh, is the president of a nonprofit suicide prevention organization. So these people have um, some very profound stories to tell about how their suicide attempts re resulted in transformation of their lives and not because of the stereotyped ideas that I think come primarily from religion, that suicide is evil and people will be damned to hell if they commit it. It's uh, what they learned in their experiences was something much more positive, that uh, life has meaning, suffering has meaning, and, um, and it's all about opportunities to advance in our spiritual wellness. So those are the kinds of things we're hoping to capture in this video um, that we're thinking about produce or planning to produce. So with that, I'll turn it over to Roberta to tell you more about the video. Um, I want to ask you a question first. Uh, how many of you have had your lives touched by suicide in some way. Hands, yeah. Look, we'll just look around the room, yeah. When I started thinking about doing this project, I hadn't really thought lately about how suicide had touched my life, but when I thought about it, I realized that I had two uncles and a cousin who had taken their own lives, um, and so that, was, you know, uh, really impacted me. But when Jan and I were talking about it, it was like, oh, this is a project. But then I went, oh, this is a very personal project. Uh, and I realized in, in, you know, talking to other people that it's very common for, for people to know someone in their family or friends, um, someone in their circle, maybe somebody who went, they went to school with. Um, and then everyone... Uh, we were all touched by Robin Williams' death, and so even the, the suicide of uh, a famous person can touch us personally. Jan and I started talking about this project two years ago, and uh, we are in uh, pre-production now. Um, I want to say that I'm quite aware that this is a very sensitive topic. And I want to be sure that any video that we produce does not do harm. That, that that is the top consideration. We don't want to model suicide behavior for anybody. Uh, because of that, I am not going to introduce any methods of suicide. When I interview people, I'm editing that out. Um, we'll talk about how they thought, what they thought, and how, I see heads nodding, I'm on the right track then. <laughs> um, it, we'll talk about how they felt before, what they were thinking before, um, when they had their NDE, what they learned from it, what they might, uh, wisdom they might have to share with others, but I want to stay away from anything that would encourage anybody. Uh, and also, um, in that same uh, vein, I want to make sure before we ever release a video that uh, it has been uh, looked at by people who are experts, very knowledgeable in this area, to make sure that we haven't done something inadvertently that I, that I wouldn't, would have escaped my eyes. So um, I just want to reassure you that we are very sensitive, that this is uh, important, and that people's lives can be impacted. We're hoping... Um, and I, I, I'm feeling pretty confident that people's lives will be positively impacted by this project. Uh, the more I interview people, the more I talk to people, the more I realize that uh, learning for people to learn about near-death experience helps them uh, helps to deter them uh, from suicide. Of course, we're not going to deter everybody. We're not going to touch everybody, but if we can, you know, if we can impact some lives positively, um, it will definitely be worth uh, our, our efforts. So as I said, we are in pre-production, which means we are interviewing 
I'm doing video interviews. I see some of my interviewees sitting out here, uh, some of the experts, uh, and I, I feel kind of humbled to be talking to, to those of you who know so much more about this topic than I do. Uh, but one of the nice things about being a filmmaker is uh, that I can let the, the experts speak directly and uh, I can learn uh, as that process unfolds as well. Uh, we are seeking more people uh, to interview who have had near-death experiences while uh, attempting suicide. So if you have anyone uh, or if you yourself uh, is in that situation, we would be happy uh, to talk with you and uh, know that your efforts uh, could you know, possibly help somebody else. Our thesis, as I guess you already know, is that learning about near-death experience can be a deterrent uh, to suicide uh, for some people. And I was going, going to mention, I see John is here, John McDonough. Um, I got his notes on his presentation, so I know that this afternoon between 5 and 6 that uh, he and Sarah Blaylock uh, are going to be talking about NDEs and psychotherapy. And one of the points that he, he made uh, was that he used, um, successfully helped people to step back from suicide as they learned about near-death experience. So it's validating, your experience is validating the effort that we are making. So if any uh, others of you uh, have uh, anything to say on this topic, see me after because I am uh, seeking interviews for, for uh, professionals and for NDEers. Um, the video that you are going to see today is seven minutes long, and it's kind of a preview. Um, it, it gives you a taste of what the video, the longer video, which I'm hoping to be about 30 minutes long. Uh, it's hard sometimes to hold these big topics to limited times, but that seems to be a good time for uh, 30, 30 minutes seems to be a good length of time for classroom use um, and uh, for um, other uses. So that's what we're going to be doing. This uh, little preview is also a fundraiser, so don't be shocked at the end when I do a plea. We do need some money. We are fundraising uh, in order to do the project uh, because it is kind of a costly uh, thing to, to do. After we show the video, uh, we are planning to have a little time for discussion. So if you're ready back there... Hello, I'm Roberta Moore. The, the audio producer isn't of the good. Video, Near Death Experience What Medical Professionals Need to Know. Okay. My partners and I at Blue Marble Films make videos with a message, and our new project is about near death experiences and suicide prevention. Professor Jan Holden has studied NDEs and suicide for a number of years. Over 40 years of research indicates that at least one out of every five people who survives a close brush with death has a near-death experience. This is an experience of ongoing consciousness even when the physical body is actually temporarily dead. Among people who've survived a close brush with death are those who've attempted suicide. Suicide NDEers have a unique and important message to contribute to the field of suicide prevention. The purpose of our video is to bring that important message to people who are contemplating suicide, people who've lost a loved one to suicide, and healthcare providers who are working with people who are considering or who have survived suicide. Suicide is not an easy thing to talk about, yet it has touched nearly all of us in some way. For myself, Two uncles and one cousin were victims of suicide, and I remember the searing pain of those deaths. Suicides impact families forever. How has your life been impacted? Was it a family member, friend, or someone famous whom you admired? Here are some stark facts. More than 40,000 Americans commit suicide every year. 22 veterans take their own lives each day. Suicide is the third leading cause of death for 15 to 24 year olds. I felt my throat tightening and expect tightening and my head and, and it was just it was a terrible feeling and I just realized at that moment I said 
Like, what have I done? I was literally crouched in the corner on the floor, having a few sips on this drink when I realized that I just needed a great escape. On May 31st, 1987, I attempted suicide. Um, they had an NDE. The NDE was uh, a dark one. Suicide knows no boundaries. People of all ages, races, genders, and socioeconomic levels take their own lives. Fortunately, there are some people who have survived their suicide attempts and who have wisdom to share about what lies beyond. Through NDEs, people often find that committing suicide is not what they expected. It was, the, it was actually uh, the pain of, 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 of suffering the things that I had done to others, even if I wasn't even aware of it. Our impact on other people is, is so dramatic, and, and in hell it's intensified, to where you are incapacitated with the overflowing of negative emotions. When I came to that firm thought in my mind, okay, this is no longer where I'm staying, I don't belong in this life, I suddenly and rather dramatically heard a voice in my head, and it very clearly and calmly said, that's all right, you can do that. Your life is your own to make decisions with. But I just want you to know, and it was very clear on this, I just want you to know that if you do this, you will be coming back and you will have to learn these things all over again. You will have to face these things that you are not facing now. I remember zoning in and out of consciousness and I remember for a split second before I completely lost consciousness that night, I said, God, I don't want to die. People who have NDEs while attempting suicide almost never attempt suicide a second time. They learn that suicide is not an escape. They find a purpose in life, often helping others in some way. Hear how Matthew turned his life to good. Patricia found her inner self, and Eloise developed an inspiring goal. And the impact was so great that when I came back from that situation that I changed my life 180 degrees. In 180 degrees, I mean by I was a $1,000 a week drug habit, uh, um, hanging out with the Hells Angels, uh, to uh, going completely straight and that I haven't had a drink or a drug since 1987. So the things that I did is I got licensed to go back into nursing. That took me a couple of years. I went to university. That took me quite a few years and I got a BA and eventually I got a master's in counseling. Everyone is put here on, for a reason on this earth and that is to love and be there for other people. Because I'm alive today, I want to become a psychologist and I want to work and I want to help people who have been through things and I want to do something wonderful in my life. And if I had died the day that I did, all that would be left is the pain that my mom is going through for the rest of her life and that's all that's left of me. Through the proposed video, Near-Death Experiences and Suicide Prevention, those people who have had NDEs can speak directly to those contemplating taking their own lives. Counselors can use the video to help their suicidal patients. Would you like to help make this suicide prevention video by making a donation? Together, we can perhaps save the lives of teenagers, veterans, our friends, neighbors, and family members. As Eloise has said, every life has meaning, and saving even one life is worth our effort. Please donate today. Thank you. So I just, with a few final comments uh, before we open for questions and discussion, um, our plan is 
once we um, do a first draft of this video, to first vet it with um, health, mental health professionals to make sure, as Roberta said, that we're um, not going to do harm. And then we're going to do some research, uh, working first with people, um, getting closer and closer to actual people who are uh, experiencing suicidal ideation right now, um, starting with uh, asking people who have felt suicidal in the past but do not feel that way now, um, how they would react to this video uh, if they can put themselves back you know, where they were in, in that state of mind, um, what effect they think the video would have had on them, and then move gradually into um, research with people who are um, um, currently suicidal, probably working through some mental health professionals who uh, have clients who are suicidal. Um, so because uh, in addition to not wanting to do any harm, um, we see the liability potential. Um, we don't want even one person who said that they um, attempted suicide because of something they saw in, in, this, um, in this production. So, um, so we're going to do some vetting of it, um, a, a lot of vetting of it, before we um, really release it for wide use. So um, that's it, and we're interested in your uh, comments, questions, um, encouragement, discouragement, uh, anything that you have to add. Robert? We, yeah, we, we have. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'd, I'd just like to mention that uh, Matthew Dovell was uh, at the 2014 conference and uh, gave a presentation, and that presentation is on the IANS uh, YouTube channel um, that anybody can uh, call up and watch. Uh, fascinating, um, distressing near-death experience, uh, which is a, a whole lot more than what uh, Jan was saying. And, um, and also he goes into his uh, support, um, international suicide prevention, um, and his process for, for suicide prevention. So that's available for anyone to see. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Hi. Hey. Uh, uh, thanks for a nice uh, presentation. Um, Thank you. Um, used to work with suicide prevention intervention a little bit, and I remember reading, you know, research back then that the more um, serious the attempt, you know, the more, you know, someone really put a gun in their mouth and stuff and somehow survived it, the chances of them doing it again were less than someone who might have did a cut or something. So, um, so the more seriousness, you know, the less likely to do it again. Then I heard Sahar talking about how NDEs sometimes they they don't do it anymore. So I was wondering, do you have anything between the seriousness of the attempt and whether or not they had an NDE? You follow the question? I, no, I no, I understand your question. I think I understand it. Um, is there a relationship between? You, you're saying that because some researcher, the, probably the preponderance of research, at least with adults, indicates that if they had an NDE in their suicide attempt, they're not as likely, they're, they're very low likelihood of attempting again. Correct. You've also seen this research that um, if the attempt involved a really serious effort, um, they're less likely to attempt again. And right. might there be a relationship between the more serious effort resulting in more likely resulting in a near-death experience. Yes, that, that was the question. I am not aware of anything like that. Hey, are, are you Bruce? Do you know? No. But it's an, it's an interesting... Because, and, uh, yeah, I used to work in Bush, Alaska a lot, and I got a chance to work with a lot of suicide. And I remember one time I had one guy, you know, I was talking about near death, and all of a sudden this guy is like, he goes, and he was missing his whole jaw. He, he said I could always share his story, but um, anyway, he was missing his jaw because he put a shotgun in there. Wow. And all of a sudden he was remembering his experience, wow. and he never did it again. And, uh, you know, it's like, uh, um, anyway, so I just 
always wondered. Yeah. I, a, I, when I heard your research, you know, going that way and stuff. Uh, anyway, yeah. Thanks. It's a great question. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Do you, do you want to go to the microphone, or, or I'll repeat your question? All okay. I want is the website. I didn't get a chance. You want the website? Okay. It's yeah, Roberta. I am so happy to talk about that. Uh, I have a brand new website that I have great hopes for. Um, it is ndevideo.com. Easy to remember, ndevideo.com. I have three, uh, three videos on there now, short videos. I have uh, this one. I have one with Elaine Drysdale, who's here. Uh, and she's doing a testimonial for the video that we did before on near-death experience, what medical professionals need to know. And there's a trailer for that. Um, I have plans. Um, I'm thinking I have quite a few uh, interviews with people who have uh, who are medical professionals. And I'm thinking about doing a section of that website for medical professionals. Um, and possibly one, I, I don't know yet, I'm still, it, it's very new. Uh, but within the next few months, I will be putting up uh, a number of um, interviews. I have a, um, a number of them that I've collected over the past few years. And some of them are so good, and I'm not using them in these videos that I'm editing and really, you know, um, that will be for sale and for wider distribution. Uh, but I want to get them out there, so they're going to be on, on this uh, website. So it's ndevideo.com. It is up now, uh, so you can go in and take a look at what's there, and please stay tuned and come back and uh, take a look at it in a month or two. Hello. Uh, the lady with the red hair on there alluded to um, maybe previous incarnations or alluded to uh, the fact that she would have another chance to work out her problems if she did commit suicide. And I was thinking about a particular uh, experience I read about, I think, on uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long's website, the NDERF website. And it was of a girl who had... Um, attempted suicide and she was informed the wisdom she brought back was that she had committed suicide in two previous incarnations and was being thrown back into the mix I guess to work out this um, issue I guess that was causing her to commit suicide but what I was thinking about in terms of not wanting to do harm to others through the video I'm just wondering what sorry wondering if um, the idea of having second chances might actually work in the opposite way and somebody thinks somebody that's on the verge goes ahead and thinks maybe i'll have another chance you mm -hmm. know maybe this is just a and so we're actually kind of well thank you for that that um you know, all of those things we want to hear in this particular case um the uh, patricia christie is the person uh, who's in the video there and she's actually here she um, you know she of course interpreted that that um, she was not <laughs> she she said no I'm not going to do these things again I'm not going through that again uh, and so it served as a great deterrent to her but I appreciate your thinking about that other interpretation because those are the kinds of things we want to be aware of and think about um, and consider. We may still use the clip, uh, but you know we'll do it in a conscious manner. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I have heard some NDEers ears use the analogy of dropping out of school. That if they attempt, if they succeed in suicide, it's like dropping out of school, and um, eventually they have to come back. Except. Uh, if you dropped out at 16 and then you finally figure out at 20 that you really needed that, um, then you have to go back and do what other people are doing at age 16. And so it's distasteful uh, to think in those terms. So it, I think you're making a really good point that we need to be sure and frame it in the sense of the distaste rather than, you know, oh, well, you can just, you know, throw this away and try again. Yeah. It's not like... Candy Crush, where if I make a mistake, oh well, I'll just go on to the next game. Yeah. 
I, I do uh, play Candy Crush, yeah. Go actually, um, my comment follows up on what you just said. I yeah. talk to angels for a living. I'm a former avionics engineer who now does that. And over the last 20 years, I've talked to a lot of people out of suicide who are very serious simply by saying, well, here's what's going to happen. I love you no matter what. You will be loved no matter what. If you do this, when you get to the other side, go for the light because you'll also be around people who are in a similarly upset state. So choose the light. Otherwise, I'll come get you. But you'll have to start over in childhood again someday and come back and redo school. I have not lost one to that speech. Hmm. Not mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. They've all said, what do you mean I have to start over? So to validate, yes, it's completely distasteful to someone in that space mm -hmm. to think that they would have to come back and not only come back and repeat it, but start all over. Yes, that's right. Good and so point. instead, we say to them, yeah. stick around for the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. anyhow, th thank you for what you're doing because it has incredible value. Yes. And when that message is coupled with that most people who get past a suicidal phase um, look back and are very glad they didn't kill themselves then. And they all mm -hmm. eventually realize it's all about love. Yes. They really get it because they experience that unconditional love of a person not judging them mm -hmm. for their mm -hmm. desire to do this. Yes. And yes. to say, I love you no matter what, yeah. you're not wrong, you're not bad. Right. We understand your pain. Yeah. But here are the facts. Yes. And so what you're doing is so, so useful and so beyond what the conventional does, and thank you. Yeah. So as, Su as Sahar said, it's um, not that you're going to be punished. It's just not in your best interest. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, I had a brother that uh, committed suicide, and, of course, it was, um, uh, you know, it was uh, devastating for the whole family. And uh, uh, we all got together and kind of had therapeutic sessions uh, as a family and went through all the process of grief and second guessing and blame and all those kinds of things that go along with that. Uh, and as, and as, a re as a result of that, you know, I promised myself as well as my family that you know, I would never consider doing something like either that, regardless of di how difficult life could get. <clears throat> so about five years later, I found myself in a circumstance where I was uh, uh, pretty much half starving to death and, and literally half frozen to death. And uh, I was in such, I had been in this, this emotional roller coaster for five years since my brother had killed himself. And, and then uh, I was in this just extreme extended physical pain. And uh, I got to a point where you know, I was trying to write, finish some business plans and things, and so cold my fingers couldn't negotiate the keyboard, and, and I was in such, again, my, my limbs were burning, freezing in such pain. So I got to the point where I was like, hey, you know, there can't be anything such as a divinity or a god or whatever, or this wouldn't be happening because I haven't done anything to deserve this. So I would basically, you know, I just wanted to put myself out of my, my misery. So I was going to unzip my jacket and just finish freezing out that night. But... Uh, I had to know whether or not there was something such as God, you know, so, which I was convinced there wasn't. So anyway, I, I, I was kind of weak, broke down on my knees, and uh, just before I unzipped, I, I just asked a question, the key question, is there such a thing? And then, you know, boom, this thing just opens up, they call it the divine conduit, and it's just basically, I, I describe it as liquid joy. And then that, then I had uh, an experience, which, which is very, very similar. I can corroborate Dr. Alexander's experience in Anita Murjani's and all that when he calls the core. You know, I've been there. And everything like this woman said in terms of total unconditional love, all that kind of stuff, that's exactly the way it is. And um, so uh, I guess the point that I wanted to make was was even if <laughs> even if you're you're totally committed not to do something like that, Life circumstances can drive you to a point where, where you know, you're about to, It's not like I was suicidal. Yes. I just, just didn't want to suffer anymore, so I was willing to do it, even after knowing how tra traumatic it was to my family. Yeah. And then this wonderful experience occurred, and that's yeah. why I'm here at this conference. So, yeah. Just to offer that. Thank you very much. Thanks for telling us. Yes, five minutes. Okay. Hey, Bruce. I wasn't going to take any more time, but after... Fred's comment, I had to say something about the ethics of doing this. Yeah. Because um, I also have concerns about harm, being harmed done with this. Yeah. And I think no matter how good the video is, I would never think of just putting this out for the public to look no. at. 
This is you a know. tool for therapists to go over with the clients. Yes. And process it with them. Yes. I think that's the only way we can guarantee that it's not going to do harm. Yes. Since Thank I'm here, I also want to say a few other things. And one is that all the data we have about suicide and NDEs, and in fact about suicide prevention, is really pretty poor. Um, you know, Sahar went through what's better and what's worse, but even the good isn't very good. And, yeah. you know, Chris was talking about um, the, um, the, the rate of, of repeated suicide, and that's all based on very poor data. And if you look at, look at like a month after the suicide attempt, most people are very non-suicidal after that. No matter what they've experienced during the suicide attempt, the shock of that, and in some sense, the relief of having killed off parts of yourself, makes you less suicidal, but it doesn't really last. Mm. And if you look at the five-year follow-up, it's very different from the one-month follow-up. Ah. And we don't really have good, good data mm -hmm. over the different studies use different populations. Mm -hmm. Also, with the experience of using NDE research with suicidal people, if I remember John's work, at least his earlier work, he's dealing with his outpatient clients who were depressed, certainly, and thinking about suicide, but weren't actually making suicide attempts. And that's a different population than I was working in an emergency room with people who actually made suicide attempts. Yeah. And we may find that these two populations respond to different types of information about NDEs. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. And one more comment I want to make about Ken Ring's comment that people who made suicide attempts had fewer transmaterial um, features. Yeah. He was dealing mostly with overdose attempters. Oh. And it may be that the drugs made it harder to remember what you experienced. Uh -huh. and that may be why he had, quote, shallower NDEs. Uh huh. Okay, thank you. So, so um, while I have you here, yeah. um, what, what do you think is the, other than we need a lot more research, is there, yeah. are there any conclusions that you think we could tentatively um, draw from the research that exists? I think we look, we look look more at what the end years say, like you're doing with your interviews. Uh huh. And Ken did some of this early on, and I know John did, and I did also. But they give you the words that are meaningful to them about preventing suicide in the future. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we can put our context of what we think makes people less suicidal, and it's not necessarily what they think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've taken some of the things that end years say about life being more meaningful. Yeah. And try to use that with suicidal people. Most crisis intervention. Uh, programs will teach you how to help people with coping skills. Mm -hmm. That doesn't change their sense of what's the meaning of life. Yeah. And it misses the point for most suicidal people. Yes, right, right. Thank you. Yes, and this will be the last comment. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, as an experiencer, also a veteran, first of all, Phil, uh, and also someone who has attempted suicide post NDE. Um, I don't know, but what I'm trying to get at is that uh, after my NDE, several years later, I broke my neck again, and I was in chronic pain for four years, I guess. And then following that, I had I went into depression, and I did attempt suicide. I fortunately had uh, some divine intervention that helped me through that. But you know, of course, uh, some people that uh, don't get the divine intervention, they just die, right? So my uh, I don't know where I was trying to go with this, but I'm try just trying to say that I don't know if that applies to every experience or mm -hmm. uh, NDE experience, because, and then the actuation, I think that means I have suicidal thoughts. The, I, I think the only thing that can contribute for me personally as an experiencer is that that voice that told me to kill myself didn't sound like the voice I heard in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if that helps anything, I mean, there, there's, it's just a different yeah. voice. You have this loving voice talking to you that absolutely loves you. And this voice in my head that said, kill yourself. You're a loser, a liar. Uh, kill yourself. I just knew that wasn't God telling me to do it mm -hmm. as opposed to. Uh, anyway, I, I just wanted to say that I think this issue is a lot more complex than uh, just saying indie ears don't, because uh, I, I, I kind of felt, well, that's just not true mm -hmm. for me. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's not true for every experiencer. Mm -hmm. Because I certainly uh, felt like uh, my life had had descended into a living hell after my experience. And I actually hated that God sent me back here Mm -hmm. uh, because I felt uh, like uh, it was all about love and and I wasn't uh, surrounded with any on earth. Yeah. But anyway, that's the negative side of it. The positive end of it is that I did find a purpose in life. And uh, it uh, and when I found that purpose in life, uh, that did help. But it mm-hmm. it was a it was a journey, not just a like quick that. answer. Yeah. It was not a quick answer. It no. was a process. Yeah, it took about saying. twenty years. Yeah. to wow. uh, get to the place where that voice yeah. doesn't talk to me anymore. Yeah. Thank you so much for your sharing. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Mm-hmm.